Imagine you're on the Japanese bullet train, built to be one of the fastest trains in the world. But it had a problem, a very loud problem. And the solution? It came from an unlikely place. The story went like this. The bullet train could reach speeds of almost 200 miles per hour. But when it rushed into a tunnel, air pressure would build in the narrow space, causing a large boom when exiting. The tunnel boom was so loud and Japanese noise standards so strict that the problem threatened to stop the bullet in its tracks, if it weren't for a bird. An engineer was tasked to solve the problem. How could the train travel smoothly through a tunnel with minimal turbulence? The answer, a kingfisher. A kingfisher moves from low resistance air to high resistance water without making a splash. The engineer modeled the front of the train on the kingfisher's beak, solving the tunnel boom problem while increasing the energy efficiency of the bullet train. The kingfisher and the bullet train is an example of biomimicry. Bio, meaning life, and mimicry, the action of imitating something. Some people refer to it as following nature's blueprint for invention. Others have called it emulating nature's genius. But it boils down to copying nature, taking nature's best designs and using them to inspire something you want to make. A bonus, nature won't sue you for copyright infringement. Biomimicry isn't a new thing. It's been done countless times throughout human history. Now, it has the new role of creating a healthier planet. To explain, let's begin with the development of human flight. The Wright brothers developed the first fixed-wing aircraft by observing how vultures, uh, no. We'll need to go back to the 15th century, when Leonardo da Vinci was sketching his flying machine, based on his observations of birds, and who went so far as to say, those who are inspired by a model other than nature are laboring in vain. Back to the Wright brothers, who several centuries later found inspiration by observing how turkey vultures soar. The wings of the first airplane, the Kitty Hawk, used vulture wings as a model. The basic idea is that nature is the ultimate source to copy ideas from. Life on Earth has been evolving for 3.8 billion years. That's a long time to reveal which systems work and which don't. Biomimicry impels us to look to the natural world to solve the technological challenges we face. Chances are, nature has already arrived at an elegant solution. You know, we are a young species on this planet. We've only been here a very, very short period of time. 200,000 years for Homo sapiens sapiens compared to 3.8 billion. And when we begin to compare ourselves with the ones who have been most successful here, we realize how far we have to go. The good thing is that we don't have to find our way there alone. Organisms are very willing to share what they know with us. And what these organisms know can be used to help us reduce our impact on the planet. Billions of years of evolution have led to organisms that are energy efficient, non-wasteful, and that keep their habitat in good shape for their offspring. They are sources for brilliant ideas on how to live sustainably. And a way to keep those brilliant ideas coming is to conserve the organisms that inspired them. Biomimicry and conservation go hand in hand. Biomimicry is a new argument for conservation. Um, we've had, of course, you know, the idea that medicines come from the rainforest, right? And that's been one of our, one of our arguments. Biomimicry is new in that it's not a molecule coming from the rainforest. It's an idea. It's an idea. Now, that's, that's fascinating. I think that biomimicry really widens um, the, the number of people that uh, conservation relates to. For, for some people, they need a reason that's different than a crisis, that's different than uh, a moral obligation. Um, some people need to recognize that nature is full of clever, fascinating ideas. And that's what gets them excited enough 
to actually spend their weekends pulling weeds um, or fixing a stream bank. Organizations like the Biomimicry Institute have been created to educate everyone from kids to professionals, people who are interested in the use of biomimicry and its connection to conservation. For the last, what, 40 years, the way we've been doing environmental education is to tell young people that we're in a crisis. And that's pretty much where that education has ended. We haven't given them any solutions. And that's got to be pretty disheartening for young people. Um, what I like about biomimicry is that it doesn't focus on the crisis. It moves from there. It says, okay, we all understand that. We understand that improvements need to be made and that they can be made, but how do we make them and where do we look for our ideas? In addition to promoting biomimicry as a new reason to conserve the natural world, the Biomimicry Institute is also using it as a tool to generate funds for conservation efforts through their Innovation for Conservation program. Innovation for Conservation is a program of the Biomimicry Institute. And um, the idea was that we wanted to create some way of uh, connecting biomimicry and conservation. We knew they were connected conceptually, but we wanted some tangible way um, of, that, of really exploring that connection. And the idea behind it is relatively simple. The idea is that companies that have a nature-inspired product or service would contribute a portion of their profits from that product or service back to the conservation of the habitat of the species that inspired their breakthrough. This seems to me to be, you know, just good manners, saying thank you. The organism that inspired the idea, in my mind, is the original patent holder. They're the inventor, in a sense. So what ideas could we be thanking nature for? For the shape of whale flippers, which is used to harvest wind energy more efficiently, for the nanostructure of shark skin that prevents bacteria growth, which can reduce our need for chemical antibiotics in hospitals, and for coral reefs that grow by sequestering carbon dioxide, which can be mimicked to manufacture concrete. If biologists come to the design table, together with engineers, architects, and inventors, they can help the people who make our world look to nature for lessons in sustainability. If I could have a magic wand, every sustainable inventor that I know, I would have a biologist by every single one of them, shoulder to shoulder. And when they say, you know, I, gosh, I, 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 need, I, I need something that, you know, I'm going to redesign a, a train shape, a car shape, um, to try to reduce the energy use, that that biologist says, come to the aquarium with me. Come to the aviary with me. We're going to look at how organisms have solved the problem you're trying to solve. The possibilities seem limited only by our creativity and our ability to pay attention to the natural world around us, a world that we now have new reason to conserve. If nature is teacher, that makes us student. If nature is mentor, that puts us in a, in a respect relationship to that mentor. And that ultimately is what will change people's behavior. Thank you.